All right. Um, any questions on any more questions on helping the survivor? We started a little late, so we might go just a little over, just a few minutes, not too long. Do most of the women that you have dealt with, mm -hmm. do they desire to return to a relationship with the abuser? Yeah, I would say most. By if by most you mean over fifty percent, I would mm -hmm. say yes. One elder in our church asked me once, he said, I assume most of the women who, by the time they come to you, they're pretty much done and ready for a divorce. And I said, no. Um, most of them, we have three unbelievers right now in the refuge, which is green pray for them. Um, we have seen someone come to faith in Christ, which is wonderful. But other than that, the rest are believers. And many of them, not all, but many of them are very mature believers, and they don't want to divorce their husband. They love their husband. They got married because they loved him. They don't want their children to come from a broken home. And most of them do everything they can to stay with them. Um, we have a couple who are just flatly determined. I'm not going to separate. I'm not going to divorce. And if that means I have to live in an abusive relationship for the rest of my life, that's what I'm going to do. And we say, okay. Um, and one of them, um, metaphorically, takes it on the chin every Thursday when she comes. He knows she goes to the refuge. And she goes anyway. And she suffers for it emotionally when she gets home, and she just deals with it. Um, I would never recommend that, but it's her choice. You know, I'm not going to, I can't make her leave. Um, some women come to us and they're already divorced, and they just didn't hear about us, and now they've heard about us, and they, they need help healing. So we have, so maybe even, maybe not a third, but probably 25% of the women in the refuge have already divorced and just need help healing. Um, some of them, we've had some who come and, yeah, they're ready for a divorce. They need to get out, but they can't get out on their own. They've tried numerous times unsuccessfully, and they need help, and their plan is to get out in a divorce. And if that's their plan, we support them fully in that. I don't believe I have the authority. She has biblical grounds for divorce. I don't have the right to declare unlawful what God has declared lawful, so we give them our support. Any other questions? I thought I saw a hand over So helping the perpetrator, we don't, again, we don't have nearly enough time to spend on this. So I am just going to give you the basics. The first thing to know uh, is that the success rate is very low. I've also done some work with drug addicts, and I've found it much easier to help a drug addict change than to help an abusive man change. Success rate's very low. Um, More it, probably because the addict knows it and admits it. Very much so. Um, an abuser is dealing with deeply ingrained patterns of behavior that it's easy for them to deny. Um, yeah. Uh, it's difficult to find hard numbers, but suffice it to say that some people don't think it's possible for an abusive man to change. Um, I beg to differ. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit, first of all, in, in the church. Second of all, from experience, I mean, I run a batter's program and we've seen men change. Um, it's not like all of them change. Um, well, many of them don't, but I have seen abusive men change. I have seen fruit. It does happen. Um, however, change is very difficult. It takes a long time, and it does not happen often. Uh, when I say the majority of abusive men change, I don't mean just 50% or 50%. I mean, again, I couldn't give you a number, but the vast majority uh, do not change. Um, now, our batterers group hasn't even been going for a year, so we don't... Um, we, we have not had someone yet who's gone over the program and graduated. So I would like to think that the statistics in our group, because it's Christian and we have the Holy Spirit, I would like to think it will be better. We've only had three men drop out. Um, we started with four, and now we have nine. Um, but I just don't, it hasn't gone far enough yet for me to be able to give any kind of statistics. Why, why is the success rate so low? Well, one of the main reasons is because abusive thinking is supported by an intricate web of self-deception. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Um, I said this before, abusive men deceive themselves into thinking their actions are justified under the circumstances. There's always a reason that what they were doing was justified. 
When you attempt to confront them about their behavior, they'll typically use three tactics to avoid taking responsibility. Uh, they'll minimize, which is where the abuser makes his behavior sound much less abusive than it actually was. Uh, classic is, I didn't yell at you. I'm just a passionate person. I was trying to get my point across. That would be minimizing. Um, the other day I was doing an intake for Turning Point, and a man said, we got in an argument, um, we were in the car, she was on her knees yelling in my face, and, and I, I just put my hand up, and, um, and two of her teeth were knocked out. I just put my hand up, and two of her teeth were knocked out. And I instantly thought of Aaron saying, I threw the gold into the fire, and out came this calf. I mean, it's, it's the exact kind of thing. Um, so a huge minimizing. I put my hand up, and two of her teeth just fell out. Um, or they'll deny. The abuser claims that his partner's account of an abusive incident is somehow untrue. That could be as simple as, I never said that. Um, my first case it, it, uh, of abuse, before I knew not to do marriage counseling, which, by the way, uh, you don't do that. we will talk about that in a little bit. I was doing marriage counseling, and the routine was, we come in, I say how it went, I ask how'd it go. She tells me all the abuse he inflicted on her, and then he says, that's not what happened, and goes through and systematically undercuts everything she said. Both of his parents were lawyers. He was excellent at arguing. He was very persuasive. It took me two months before I realized something's just not right here. But he would just go through systematically and deny, here's what really happened. Here's how she's exaggerating. Here how she, and I've since learned, she's not as precise at expressing herself, um, but she was telling the truth. Uh, he was the one who was lying. Or third, blame shift. The abuser blames his partner for his behavior or shifts the focus of the conversation away from his behavior and toward hers. I wouldn't have yelled at you if you hadn't made me so angry. I hear that all the time. Um, so in his own mind, the abuser is actually the victim. And he was acting in self-defense. Really, in his own mind, he is the victim. Yes? Help me reconcile something right here. <laughs> okay. It's just... I probably... I don't know. Yeah. Um, very low success rate. Yeah. Very deeply ingrained patterns. Yeah. Change that is extremely difficult. Yeah. Working with professing believers. Yeah. Where, where do we reconcile here? true regeneration yeah. of the heart. That's a great question. Or just a conversion experience that allows an abuser with this deeply ingrained pattern to continue it in a Christian yeah. world. So I you know I'm just I'm blown away. And I guess honestly in front of brothers and sisters, yeah. before I became a believer and mm -hmm. regenerated totally, you could have described me in all of this. Sure. Without the physical. Sure. You and, know and, and the, the 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 total breakdown of my heart and a regeneration experience that just left me broken and wounded mm -hmm. and totally transformed over time. It, I'm, I'm I'm perplexed and and it, it hurts to think that a lot of these men, professing yeah. believers, or perhaps haven't really experienced a regeneration. Yeah. Because what. If, what does a regeneration do to a man's heart? Yeah. If it's true, if not, the breaking of this. Well, um, there are, I, there are, I'm sure, some men in Turning Point who are not believers. I would not be surprised at all who profess faith in Christ. That's certainly a very easy and I think a very um, probable explanation for many of them. At the same time, I would say when you do a lot of counseling like I do, and not just abuse, but just counseling in general. Um, compared to people who don't. I have seen Christians do some pretty atrocious things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, really. Uh, people who I do believe to be regenerate believers. Um, Jeremiah wasn't just writing about unbelievers when he said the heart is deceitful. And so I don't believe that all abusive men by definition are unbelievers. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it, even, even with that regeneration, the ability mm -hmm. to stay in a deeply ingrained pattern. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, there are believers, be believing men who are addicted to pornography. Yeah, sure. Well, and I mean, that's, uh, and yeah. believers who are addicted to drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Or alcohol. Yeah. Um, so, um, without a doubt, it where the push really comes to shove is if your church practices church discipline, which ours does, Village Seven does, 
um, if you put him under discipline, how does he respond? That's where you really well, thank start you. That to was going to be my next question. Yeah. Right? Being if the, if the true believer and you move into discipline, yeah. is that where you maybe can That's where you would expect to God. see some evidence, yeah. Yes. Wouldn't you say that usually they're, they don't have exactly like a thriving spiritual life? Uh, yeah, I it's, would definitely I mean, they that. might be a believer, but they're not exactly reading the word or praying or... Yeah, I mean, even the guys who are pastors in Turning Point, preaching sermons every week, I don't believe any of them were, uh, either of them were reading the word every day apart from sermon preparation. Um, one of them, their wives flatly said he did nothing to spiritually shepherd our children. Um, that just was not part of... So yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah. For the, for the, there could always be some exceptions to the rule, but yeah, I've never come across one. Yes? Your paper that was that big and yeah, said the freezer paper. submission. submission. Yeah. I don't believe that the men are really taught how to live a life as Christ gave their life for the church. Yes. So the part they hear is submission. Very much so, so now they have the little wife and the little wife wants to love him and gives him the biggest pork chop and you know when the cooking you have yeah, really <laughs> you your babies, give me both. <laughs> what do you mean you wanted some too yeah. but um, because, <laughs> because the submission part is so taught that as women we don't know what in the world we're supposed to do with Very this man so. that is supposed to be the head of the house and is not yeah mm -hmm. so that we get this um strange kind of um, a man who claims to be a Christian. You met him in church. He's, mm -hmm. He could be an elder, and yet when he comes home, it's a totally different mm -hmm. thing. You know, he's the head of the house, and you have to submit. Yeah. And things get crazier and crazier, and you really don't know. So then the woman becomes the enabler. The woman becomes the one that is allowing the sin to occur. And at, one, at what point does she you know, I, I know, real, I realize that our relationship has to be with God first before mm -hmm. it can be with our husbands. Mm -hmm. But that part is so uh, <clears throat> not taught in the church. It's How do you perfect. become a leader? Yeah. How do you become a submissive? A submission, you know, in the United States, especially if you're president of the company, you're better than the guy that cleans, cleans the toilet. Right. You know, so that it becomes a very, very difficult thing to yeah. separate and to know what to do with it. Yeah, let me, I, I guess I'd say two things in response to that. One, um, uh, I have an agreement, and then one thing I would actually correct a little bit. Um, I, I wouldn't refer to survivors of abuse as enablers. Um, they are acting in a God-given instinct of self-preservation. Survival, that's right. And, and as a human being created in God's image, having value and worth, um, they should be protected. They have value and dignity that should be protected. So in the context of an abusive relationship, fear is really the only way to do it. That's why getting out is so important. There, there is no other way she can relate to him. That would be to deny her God-given instinct. Um, I do agree that the church is, is, has a huge role to play in, in the way submission is viewed. I had, I, I'm not abusive, but I had, coming out of seminary, um, I had a view of submission that was too authoritarian. Um, there's really three different views of, the, of, of marriage roles. There's authoritarianism, which says the man is the absolute monarch of the home, and many of many of proponents would say men are superior to women in God's created order. There's complementarianism, which is what we are, that men and women have equal value but different roles. And then there's egalitarianism, which says they have equal value and equal roles. There is no... Headship. The problem is our society is becoming more and more egalitarian. Christian churches, evangelical churches, seminaries are becoming egalitarian. So those of us who are complementarian now are responding to that. And, and I, I understand why and critiquing it. The problem is whenever, and a pastor, I, I mean this is not theoretical, I know exactly what are in guys', guys minds when they preach on submission. The foil is egalitarianism. And so it's presented in contrast to, as a polemic, arguing against egalitarianism. The problem is, when you teach a position on anything, arguing against something else, you become unbalanced, always, and you only present. So there's a huge emphasis on um, men are the head of the home, 
men do have authority in the home, not like what those awful egalitarians say. There is not an emphasis on, but here's what that looks like, mutuality, respecting your wife. There is, I've never heard a sermon on that. I really haven't. I've heard lots of sermons on male authority and headship in the home. So, um, and what happens is when you only present an unbalanced view, your complementarianism starts to look a lot more like authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, I think, what a lot of guys, pastors, are unknowingly bequeathing to their people, even though they themselves don't believe it. The other part of it is an abusive man, as I've already said, has an uncanny ability to take the best, most wonderful truth and twist it, without a doubt. Um, and that, that's certainly, they bear the most responsibility, but the church does as well. So I never preach on submission or gender roles without using the qualification of abuse. If you're in an abusive relationship, this, this is going to look very different for you. Um, and actually, Lloyd, the senior pastor of our church, taught me to do that before he knew anything about, before we started the refuge or anything. Um, so I think that's always important. So, uh, minimize, deny, blame, shift. Okay. The abuser is actually the victim and is acting in self-defense. That's a result of, of blame shifting. So an abusive man has a defense system that is very sophisticated and very difficult to penetrate. He's minimizing, denying, and blame shifting all over the place when you try to confront him on something. Um, so you can't just sit down with an abuser, and, ex and this is not theoretical, I've done this so much. You can't just sit down and ex expect to have a rational conversation where you explain his sin to him, and he agrees that he's abusive and needs to change. That will not happen. You will get minimizing, denying, blame shifting, and combinations. And that's it. That's it. Non-abusive people can use some of these tactics. They're not... Ex but... Abuse of them when they're confronted, this is it. This is their response. If they had the ability to reflect on their own behavior with humility and really examine their hearts, they wouldn't be abusive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how do you minister to them? How, this is the problem, this is what you're facing. Um, how do you minister to them? The first component is accountability. An abusive man will not change unless he's experienced consequences for his actions and unless he knows he will experience more consequences unless he changes. Accountability is absolutely essential. Um, if a man who is physically abusive never experiences consequences for his actions, there is a 97% chance he will continue to be violent. The 3% that don't continue to be violent um, escalate emotional and verbal abuse to compensate for it. So maybe there's 0.5% that are regenerated and changed forever. Um, but for the majority, 97%. But if a man who is physically abusive is convicted, does jail time, and undergoes extensive mandatory treatment, the chance that he'll continue to be violent lowers to 50%. 50%. However, before we start rejoicing at that, most of those will increase psychological abuse and other forms of abuse to compensate. So they'll stop being violent. That doesn't mean they'll stop being abusive. What's difficult is, in terms, again, in terms of success rate, this is about the, the most concrete number we have. Uh, it's hard to measure psychological abuse when the men aren't convicted and you don't track them. So um, Now, accountability can come in many forms. It can be legal accountability, like we're talking about. Um, it can come through church discipline, which I would recommend for every case of abuse. In terms of the timing and, and how, it, how it goes, that, that can change from case to case. But. Or the accountability can come from his wife. Last night, some of you may remember, I said most of the men in our batterers group are there because their wives will leave them if they don't complete the program. That's why they're there. Um, some of them are already separated. And they have to complete the program in order to be reunited with their wives. Others are there just under the threat of separation or divorce, and they don't think it's an empty threat, and, and it's not. Um, Which is less